Welcome to the Sagres Bird Watching and Nature Activities Festival. This year, not only in Sagres, but also with this online component, which allows us to reach other people and to invite speakers who are far away, like uh, José Pedro Tavares, who's going to be talking today about vulture conservation in Europe. José Pedro is the director of the Vulture Conservation Foundation, and he has worked with SPARE, the Portuguese Society for the Study of birds as well, both in this capacity and also uh, in previous work with BirdLife International. So I'm going to hand over the floor to Zé Pedro and if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat and I'll relay them to Zé Pedro at the end. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sonia. And thank you very much, Spea, for uh, uh, the invitation to, uh, uh, to do this webinar. And thank you all for, for being there and, uh, and, and for being interested in, on, on vultures. I'm sorry that I cannot be present in Sagres. I've been many, many times in the Sagres Birdwatching Festival. I was associated with the first few uh, editions of the Sagres Birdwatching Festival. I've seen many, many vultures. Um, and I, I will start uh, sharing uh, my, uh, my screen. Uh, Sonia, can you just confirm that you can see the screen? Okay, so yeah, as, as I was saying, uh, I've seen many, many vultures in, in Sagres, uh, Egyptian vultures, of course, uh, and uh, later on in, in October, these fantastic uh, flocks of, of, of griffon vultures. And I think you'll, um, you, you'll agree with me that if, you've, if, if you once see a vulture in the sky, or if you, are, of, or if you once uh, uh, peer into the eye of a birdie vulture, and this is, this is an eye of a birdie vulture in the picture, you will never forget. You will be, you'll be enchanted by, uh, by these creatures. Uh, I was, uh, and, uh, um, and therefore you'll dedicate at least a, a part of your life uh, to, do something, uh, to do something for them. Um, what I will uh, um, okay. What I will talk today is about uh, the situation of vultures in Europe, and the situation of vultures in Europe is uh, globally a very, very positive story. Uh, it's a story of success. It's a story of uh, reintroductions, restoration. It's a story of restoration of uh, populations and distribution uh, distribution ranges. If you, if you ask me 40 years ago, uh, where can I see uh, vultures in great quantity? I want to go to a place where I can see hundreds or thousands of vultures. I would tell you 40 years ago, go to Asia, because uh, uh, this was the picture in Asia 40 years ago. You would go to any uh, Asian town. This is a, a, a picture in India. And you'd see thousands and thousands of vultures fighting to pick uh, uh, the garbage. This is a garbage dump in an Indian town fighting to, to, to pick up the garbage. Uh, this species, the Indian uh, white-backed vulture, was uh, once upon a time uh, uh, the world's most common bird of prey. There were 40 million of them only in India. You go to India today and you don't see this because the populations of vultures in India cr uh, crashed, declined by 99%. You go to India or to Pakistan or to Bangladesh today and you don't see any vulture. It's very difficult to see vultures. If you had asked me the same question 20 years ago, I would say, well, go to Africa. This is the quintessential Africa picture. Savanna, uh, a lion kills some zebra, and then the vultures come and descend and uh, uh, feed on the, uh, on the rests of the, uh, of the lion's meal. Um, very common scene 20 years ago in many national parks throughout really uh, most of Africa, uh, across the African savanna. You go to the African savanna today and you, you, you will find it very, very hard to take a picture like this. Because unfortunately in Africa, we are, we are, we are uh, witnessing a dramatic decline of vultures, usually associated with poisoning, usually associated with, with poaching in fact, um, and vultures uh, are being killed. They are dying in great quantities across across the country. In fact, um, Africa uh, holds 11 species of vultures and seven of them are classified by the IUCN as critically endangered or endangered. In Europe, we only have got one species which is classified as endangered at global level, which is the Egyptian vulture. But in Africa, most species, most African vulture species in Africa are, are, are in fact in a, in a much poorer conservation uh, status than, uh, than you, you, the European one. In fact, your best chance 
of seeing uh, vultures today is in Europe, where um, pictures like this one in, in, the, in, in the screen are very, very common in Portugal, in Spain, in France. Um, uh, and this is because Europe's vultures uh, have actually increased in population, have increased in distribution range, have recolonized former areas, and are today much more abundant than they were 100 years ago or 150 years ago. So these are the four species of vultures in Europe. Uh, we have got only four species, even though increasingly a, a fifth and even a sixth species, African species, are starting to, to be seen in, in Europe because um, they, they come across more frequently uh, across the, the Strait of Gibraltar in Europe. But these are the four breeding species in Europe. The griffon vulture, uh, uh, in your screen from left to right, the griffon vulture, the most common species. Then the very large uh, Cinereus vulture or the European black vulture the spectacular birded vulture in the center of the picture, and then uh, the small Egyptian vulture on the right of the picture, the, 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 the one with the yellow face, uh, which is also uh, Europe's only migrating uh, vulture species, uh, while most all the others uh, uh, mostly stay in Europe and are mostly sedentary. The Egyptian vulture migrates to Africa uh, every winter uh, and then comes back every spring to breed in, uh, in Europe. What I will do um, over the next uh, um, uh, 20 minutes or so is I'll give you a, a very broad picture of the status distribution of, uh, of these vultures across, uh, across Europe. Um, vultures uh, uh, occur mostly uh, around the Mediterranean, and this is the distribution of vultures in, in Europe in, in, in red. They, 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 they distribute themselves, well, they occur mostly in mountains, in mountainous habitats, and across the Mediterranean. Uh, they need uh, warm air currents to fly. They are soaring birds like uh, all, the other, uh, all the other raptors, and therefore um, uh, they, um, uh, they are at, you know, at, at its best in, in mountainous habitats. That's also the habitat where there is usually either wild or domestic livestock uh, grazing animals uh, on which they, they feed. Uh, I assume you all know that vultures are obligate scavengers. This means that they uh, only eat dead meat. They are not equipped uh, and they, they, uh, uh, they, they cannot uh, hunt for live prey and therefore uh, they, they eat um, only uh, dead, um, uh, dead meat. The first message really that I would like to leave you is that um, Europe is today um, uh, really the, the, the land of vultures when, when you compare it with Africa and Asia. It's also where vulture conservation best practice uh, is, uh, is, is applied. That's where we've got the know-how and all the tools and the techniques to successfully restore vulture populations. It is a very, very positive story. It's a story of, yes, we can. We can save biodiversity if only we are given the means. And this is really important because, um, unfortunately, as you very well know, most of biodiversity is indeed decreasing. Uh, and this creates somehow uh, a culture of doom and gloom in the conservation world, uh, which sometimes is frustrating and a little bit tiring. Everything is disappearing. Everything is going down the drain. We are losing biodiversity. Is there any hope? I think it's very important to bring once in a while some very positive stories uh, to show that, yes, we can. Uh, yes, there is hope. Yes, we can save biodiversity. In fact, we have done it and, 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 and we, we, are, we, are, we are continuously, uh, continuously doing. Another, not, nothing better to, to, to really show this, this wonderful uh, uh, positive story than the story of, of, of the birded vulture, formerly called Lammergeier. This is um, a, a vulture of um, uh, uh, really the, the high mountains. It occurs all the way from Europe to, to Asia uh, and across Africa. In Africa, south of the Sahara, it's a different subspecies. But in, in Eurasia, it occurred once upon a time from, uh, from Portugal and Spain all the way to Mongolia and, uh, and, uh, and China. Uh, in red, this is the, the area uh, uh, where the, the species um, disappeared. Um, the species disappeared because uh, the birded vulture actually looks like an eagle. Um, and uh, uh, for, for, for centuries, people thought that the, the birded vulture would catch 
uh, the, the small lambs uh, which were raised in, in the mountains throughout Eurasia. So they, um, they poisoned it to, 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 to extinction, they shot, they disturbed them, and these species, um, uh, bit by bit, started to disappear from the European mountains and from the European skies. On the right-hand side, you've got there, uh, this is a picture from 1913, and this is the last birded vulture from the Alps. It was completely uh, hunted, exterminated from that very large alpine uh, mountain chain. Um, and uh, it, uh, it, it disappeared completely uh, in the beginning of the 20th century from the Alps as uh, it disappeared from many other European mountain ranges. So much so that by 1980, uh, it was extremely rare in Europe. It only really survived in the Pyrenees a few pairs in the Pyrenees, about 40 pairs in the Pyrenees, and then a couple of very isolated and very small populations in Corsica, in Crete, in the Balkans, and then from Turkey eastwards. Uh, uh, but in Europe, it was, it was really close to, uh, to extinction with, with only about 50 pairs or so. Uh, and, and in mainland Europe, it was really only restricted to the, um, uh, to the Pyrenees. It was then that uh, a group of, of visionaries, uh, uh, a group of conservationists, a group of dreamers, uh, and aren't we uh, all, um, uh, decided in the 70s uh, to, to, to change the situation and decided to bring the species first back to the Alps, uh, to, that, to that large mountain chain. Uh, so we want to bring the birded vulture back to the Alps. It was extinct in the beginning of the 20th century. How are we going to do this? Well, the only chance to do this was through captive breeding because the species was extremely rare in Europe. There was only 40 pairs in, in the Pyrenees. You were not going to catch the birds in the Pyrenees because you would, uh, you would contribute to the, to, to the further decrease of the population. So the only, the only chance was to use some birds that existed uh, in captivity uh, to try to breed them in captivity and then reintroduce them into the Alps. And this is really the origin of the, of the Vulture Conservation Foundation. This group of people bought from zoos, there were about 30 or 40 birds in captivity in zoos in Europe. They bought these 30 or 40 zoos and they entrusted them to an international foundation, which was established then, 30 years ago, to breed them in captivity and reintroduce them into the wild. And indeed, for the first uh, 25 or 30 years of the, of, of, of the existence of the Vulture Conservation Foundation, uh, which I now direct, our ob only objective was to, uh, to, to breed birdie vultures in captivity and to reintroduce them into the wild. We have since expanded our remit and our projects and are now doing much more than that, doing a lot of conservation work with the four uh, vulture species across Europe. But for, um, for many years, uh, we really focused on breeding, uh, breeding these birds in, in captivity. And indeed, um, it's, not a, it's not an easy thing, but indeed over the years we've developed all the know-how, the technique, the protocols, um, uh, and the knowledge that allows us to do exactly that, breed them in captivity and breed them in captivity through natural ways, uh, so that, uh, you know, captive parents raise captive young, uh, so we avoid human imprinting and so on, so that the, the, the young that are born in captivity are then reintroduced into the wild. This is not how we reintroduce our birds into the wild, but this is a fantastic picture. And I think it kind of symbolizes uh, the project. The bird that you see is actually um, a bird that was uh, uh, caught weakened and wounded, uh, went into rehabilitation and was, and was released. And therefore it was released like that. Um, uh, but indeed, this story of releasing birds to this magnificent mountain chain, which is the Alps, has been a, a, a fantastic story. The way we release them is, is different, it's, it's like this. Uh, in those two boxes, there are um, uh, young birded vultures that came from a captive breeding station somewhere in Europe uh, and are there transported when they are about three months and about uh, three or four weeks before they are uh, uh, due to fledge, they are transported to um, a hacking cave which is prepared, a uh, platform which is prepared 
in the mountains in a very natural uh, environment where they are then uh, left alone and fed without any human um, contact so that they fledge naturally from the mountains uh, from that nest uh, and therefore imprint uh, on, on, on that site uh, to come back to it uh, to breed. We know, uh, and, and science tells us that, that the, the last few weeks before fledgling and, and, and the first few weeks after fledgling are the most important ones in terms of making the, the individual faithful to a site. And, and, and those, those weeks uh, the birds spend on the natural environment. They are uh, watched 24 seven by, um, uh, for about two months by a group of uh, uh, volunteers, staff, uh, partner, uh, partner staff and, and so on to make sure that nothing happens to them and that the whole operation goes uh, very well. And then eventually um, uh, when they uh, feel like fledging, uh, they fledge into the mountains um, uh, and uh, hopefully 10 years later, because these birds are very long lived and they take, and they take 10 years before breeding for the first time, they came back to the same place to, um, uh, to breed. In the moment, so it, this, this all started 35 years ago, we now have got uh, close to 200 birds in captivity. Uh, we manage uh, or co-manage a number of specialized breeding centers. Um, this is uh, facilities that are not open to the public, where uh, we really breed these birds to, to, to introduce and release them. Uh, but we also distributed birds uh, in many zoos, in about 38 zoos um, across Europe, uh, that follow our guidelines, that house our birds according to uh, our protocols, and that contribute to this, um, to this wonderful um, uh, adventure. Uh, and in fact, between 78 and 2019, we've already raised 565 juveniles. I should add there the, the, the results of the 2020 breeding season, uh, of which uh, much more than half of them, so 323, were released uh, mostly in the Alps, where we've already released over 200 birds, but also in a number of other locations where we've started a reintroduction project. And I'll come back to this uh, in, in a minute. And the results have been absolutely fantastic. Uh, so this is the, 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 the graph, the wonderful graph. The, well, unfortunately, it looks like the, 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 the coronavirus graph these days uh, that you know worry worry uh, worry us so much. Uh, in that case, it's a negative graph. In, in this case, it's a, it's a fantastic positive graph because it's a, a graph of population growth. Um, we released the first bird in the Alps in 1986, um, and as I said, they take 10 years to breed. In in that case, it took 11. The first breeding occurred in 1997, and this is the number of pairs. And as you can see, the number of pairs has been growing, uh, this, is, this is wild pairs, has been growing in the Alps from one in 1997 to last year we had over 60 breeding pairs in, uh, in, in the Alps. Distributed in, uh, uh, across the, the, the very large mountain chain. In green, you've got the, um, the breeding pairs. In red, you do have the several release sites uh, that uh, we have used uh, to, 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 to reintroduce this population and to restore this population to the, um, uh, to, to the mountain chain. Um, in fact, we don't need to uh, keep releasing birds because the number of uh, uh, wild hatched birded vultures, the number of birded vultures that are hatching now in wild nests uh, uh, and, and, and that are recruiting to the population, has by now uh, um, uh, surpassed the number of birds that we've released since the beginning of the, um, uh, of the project. So this population is, demo from a demographic point of view, uh, sustainable, solid, and in fact, we are closing this reintroduction pro project after 30 years um, uh, and, and, and opening new ones uh, with, the, with the birds that we continuously breed in, in, in captivity. What this project also uh, showed to us is that uh, um, uh, this species has worked as a wonderful um, magnet uh, to uh, attract all the stakeholders for a common and collaborative project. Unlike many other biodiversity uh, species, um, the birded vulture is, is neutral, is charismatic, is charismatic, 
is beautiful and, and, and really uh, uh, has attracted all from the local authorities to livestock breeders, to hunters, to tourism operators, everybody wants to, to really participate and contribute to this project that has been so positive. It's what the French called uh, a projet fédérateur. Uh, when you go and release birds, and this is, for example, in a valley in Italy, um, everybody wants to come and see, even if it is for five minutes. This is another picture. This is actually a reintroduction project in Spain. Um, uh, we only show the birds for five minutes because we do not really want to stress them out. Uh, but in those five minutes that we show the birds, the whole village, the whole local village, and these birds will be released in the mountain next to them, uh, comes to see them um, uh, because uh, uh, these projects are, are, are indeed multidisciplinary uh, and, uh, and very, very, very positive. Um, and again, another picture of such uh, an event, this time in France, uh, where uh, lots of people come and see the birds before they are taken to, uh, to the mountains. This is, as I said, a, a multidisciplinary project that took many, many years in the making. Um, and of course, it's a project that, that cannot be made by one person or by one organization. And in fact, the VCF has been working with dozens of organizations, NGOs, national parks, protected areas, regional governments, local authorities, in order to reintroduce and then uh, protect and, and monitor these birded vultures uh, for, for decades, decades to, um, uh, to come. And in fact, the project is so positive uh, uh, that it even uh, it even you know marks people outside of the Alps. This is a bird that was released in the Alps at some point, and then as they do during two years uh, before it finally came back to the Alps to to breed. This bird is now back in the Alps. Um, uh, it decided to do two very long trips. The first one was across France and Germany. Uh, and then the second one, uh, and then it came back to the Alps, and then at some point again, it, uh, it decided to, 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 to fly into Eastern Europe, and it went all the way to Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, and Romania. Uh, and in Romania, a, a, local, a local brewery, a beer maker, an artisan, artisanal beer maker, was so enchanted by the story of this bird, by our, our project, this bird was called Adonis, by the way, uh, that even uh, decided to do a special beer uh, named Adonis uh, because this bird, while it was in Romania briefly, passed and flew above uh, the brewery or the town where the brewery was located. Uh, and we know this, of course, because this bird uh, was one of the birds that was reintroduced and we, we, uh, we put a, a GPS tag on all the birds that are reintroduced. So the, the project in the Alps was indeed a, a, a huge success, uh, so much so that we started then to uh, ask ourselves, okay, I mean, uh, fine, we, we restore the population in the Alps, but we ought to do more than that. We ought to now think at European scale. So what we did is we did what the satellites do. We went, to, we, we, we took a step back, we looked at Europe and said, okay, you know, okay, the, the population in the Alps is restored, but if we want to restore this, this species at, at, at European level, and create a meta population, where should we really uh, then uh, start introduction projects uh, to achieve a, a sustainable meta population? So we started in the Alps, as I mentioned, but very soon we then uh, uh, started a second uh, reintroduction project in Andalusia in 2006, uh, where the species had already gone extinct as well. Then in uh, 2010, um, uh, we started a, a reintroduction project between the Pyrenees and the Alps to try to connect, which is still ongoing, in the Massif Central, the French Massif Central, to try to connect the two populations. And then finally, in 2018, we even started a, a, a fourth reintroduction project uh, in the Maestrasgo mountain, in between the Pyrenees and Andalusia, to try to connect, from a genetical and demographical point of view, uh, the populations between Andalusia and uh, the Pyrenees. We've also um, given some captive bird, uh, bred birds to the, to the Corsican population to restore it. Uh, and we are very soon going to start a fifth reintroduction project in the Balkans, in Bulgaria, to restore the species uh, where, again, it uh, has also uh, disappeared. One word about the Andalusian project. 
So we started the, the Andalusian project because this is the closest to Portugal. We started the, 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 the project there in 2006. Um, uh, and uh, in uh, 2010, well, we, we started with the feasibility study in 2006, with the preparation of the project in 2006. The first releases uh, happened uh, one, one year later. And I'm very happy to, uh, to, to say that there are already seven breeding pairs in Andalusia, of which three um, uh, uh, breed on a regular basis. This year, uh, the three started to breed, only two were successful. Uh, but the, the, the important point I want to make here is that because the number of birds in Andalusia is increasing, both through our introductions and also because the birds have, are already breeding in the wild, the number of observations of this species in Portugal has also, uh, has also increased. Uh, and while the species have not, see, have not been seen in Portugal for over a, a hundred years, in the last four or five years, We've had seven or eight observations of birds, birds like this one, that come from Andalusia and our introduction project and do a tour of um, uh, Iberia, uh, passing through Portugal, uh, and then eventually uh, going back to Andalusia or settling the, or, or, or spending some time in some other mountain range in, uh, in Spain. So please keep your eyes open if you are in Sagres um, or anywhere really in Portugal, because almost every year or every year now, we've got observations of birded vulture. So my second message is that this, this project, the birded vulture introduction, is one of the most successful wildlife comeback stories of our times. It's a project that has really captured the imagination of people. It's a long-term project. It, it lasts 30 to 40 years. We've started the project last year in Spain or two years ago in Spain in Maestrasgo. And unfortunately, or, or fortunately, uh, probably uh, the, 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 you know, the end of that project will only be seen by possibly my son and my daughter, not, not me because it will be in 40 years time. Uh, but uh, the, the truth is these are very successful projects um, and are, are projects that are really, um, you know, a case study of uh, uh, conservation success. Let's review very quickly um, the status and distribution of uh, the other three species. Griffin vulture, most common uh, vulture species in Europe. Uh, again, it was much, much rarer than it is now. In 1986, for example, uh, there were only about 5,000 pairs across Europe. Uh, but in the last 20 years, this population has increased by 200%. And in Spain alone, there are now 30,000 pairs of, uh, uh, of, of, griffin, uh, of, of griffin vulture. This uh, increase has been mirrored in many places, in Portugal as well, where the population has increased, and in places like this in France, where, uh, and this some of the wonderful canyons of, of southern France, where again the population had disappeared at one point, and where, where it has been increasing from zero to, to thousands of pairs in the last uh, 20 to, um, to 30 years as well. We are still working with griffin vultures, notably, uh, for example, um, reinforcing and restocking populations. We are uh, uh, implementing a life project in this beautiful island of Sardinia in Italy, where the island population is very small, and we are where we are bringing griffin vultures from Spain to reinforce the local population with a very good success. These birds, by the way, are not uh, caught in the wild. We never catch birds in the wild. These are birds that go into rehabilitation centers. And then we've got protocols and agreements with the Spanish uh, ministry and with the regional governments uh, in Spain uh, for them to provide us with those birds. Uh, and they are then released uh, um, uh, in countries where the griffin population is weaker than Spain to contribute either to reintroduction or to restocking efforts. Cinereus vulture, again, um, a very uh, a, a species which has increased uh, immensely, 50% uh, increase in the last decade. This is still a species that is quite rare. It really only breeds in Portugal, Spain, France, and then in a small colony in, uh, in Greece. Uh, in, in France, it was reintroduced. It was, it was extinct, but it was reintroduced. There is now 35 breeding pairs there. 
in Spain, it has increased a lot. In, in 1980, there were only 250 pairs. There's now uh, uh, between 2,000, 2,500 and 3,000 pairs in Spain. And in fact, we, uh, we have benefited immensely. We, Portugal, benefited immensely from this increase of the Spanish population because the species went extinct in, in our country in 1980. Um, and then in the last 15 years, recolonized. Uh, and this is a picture of this year, um, a Cineros vulture that I had the pleasure to, uh, to tag uh, in the Douro Valley. Um, uh, and we had just equipped the Cineros vulture with a GPS tag in a wild nest, uh, one of two Cineros vultures that have recolon recolonized uh, the Douro Valley from uh, the Spanish colonies. Uh, and in fact, <clears throat> there, are, there are really three populations in Portugal right now, a very small population in the Douro Valley um, up in the north. Then we've got a population in Tejo Interna <coughs> Internacional um, with about um, uh, 20, uh, 20 pairs. And then a population in the zona, in the uh, Mora Marão, uh, Morão Barrancos area with about 10 pairs that recolonized from the Spanish colonies. Uh, and, and the population is increasing everywhere in Spain, in France, in Greece, and in, uh, in, in, in Portugal. Uh, in France, as mentioned, it has been reintroduced. There are now th in three sites, and there are now three small populations uh, totaling 35 breeding uh, pairs. And we are reintroducing it into, into Bulgaria. Uh, I mentioned that there was only a very small colony le left in, um, uh, in Greece. Uh, we are now reintroducing it uh, into, uh, into the Balkans uh, as part of another life project. Um, we, uh, we will, by, by, by 2021, release 50 Cineros vultures that again come from Spain, that again come from rehabilitation centers. This is the picture of their aviary. Before they are released, they are put in an aviary to acclimatize. The area has already griffon vultures uh, breeding and therefore they are attracted to the cage and they, they perch on top of the cage. And then the birds um, uh, are released. Some of them come from zoos, very few of them, and they are put in a, 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 a hacking platform. They are tree nesters um, uh, to, to again uh, uh, be, uh, uh, to fledge uh, naturally from that hacking platform, uh, like in, in those pictures, but the majority of them come from rehabilitation centers and are released from aviaries. And the problem with these birds is that unlike the Iberian ones, which are mostly sedentaries, these birds travel a lot. Uh, in the Balkans, vultures are mostly uh, partially migratory, and therefore um, the vultures that we released in Bulgaria, for example, spend a considerable amount of time in Turkey, in places like the border between Iran and Iraq, which of course add some challenges to the conservation. Uh, and you can, if, uh, and, and you know, and this is really important. Vulture conservation can only be an international uh, and regional affair uh, because vultures, f you know, fly uh, far and wide, and you don't you you don't really achieve anything if you really focus in a very small area. You need to you, you need to focus in, 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 in you know in a in a continent really uh, in vast areas and have actions monitoring and conservation uh, actions in in in, in those uh, vast areas if you want to uh, to be successful uh, with um, with your projects. And finally, before I finish, um, the Egyptian vulture. This is the only migratory vulture in Europe. It's also the only one which is really not yet showing um, uh, the very positive population increases that we see with the other three species. In some areas in Europe, this uh, species is still declining. Uh, for example, this is a picture of Iberia uh, with a population of, uh, of Egyptian vulture. In some areas, uh, this species is stable. In some areas, it's actually increasing, but in some other areas, it's still decreasing. And therefore, it's the one where we are focusing quite a lot of our, uh, of our work. Um, I will not go into this. One of our projects uh, that uh, we've been implementing has been in one of the strongholds of the species together with SPARE and many other partners in the Douro Valley, um, where there's uh, over 100 pairs of Egyptian vulture breeding, precisely to try to improve uh, the conservation status of the species uh, in this area and elsewhere in uh, Iberia. We have been, for example, putting a lot of GPS tags on birds that then migrate to Africa. 
uh, some of them, who knows, uh, uh, pass through through uh, through Sagres. Um, but this has this has allowed us to, for example, map very carefully uh, their migration routes, uh, the threats that they face, uh, and the conservation action that needs to be done across the wintering uh, flyway or the, the the flyway, the entire flyway of the species, in order to um, maximize their their survival. And we are doing this at global level. Uh, because they use both the Gibraltar flyway but also the Eastern Mediterranean uh, flyway. We are also, we are, we are also experimenting with captive breeding of the species uh, because it is rare, because very few enter rehabilitation centers. If one day we want to do reintroduction or restocking, we should use the same techniques or the same, the same approach as we've used with the birded vulture. And therefore, we uh, are developing the protocols and the techniques. Uh, we are at a much earlier stage than with the birded vulture, but together with a number of partners are trying to develop these protocols and are already experimentally uh, releasing captive bred uh, Egyptian vultures with different techniques to try to see what uh, works best. We've got here one great, great difficulty. These are migratory birds. And of course, you cannot teach um, a captive bred bird to migrate. Uh, we, you can, of course, try to induce it to migrate by following others. And that's why we are doing it in these, um, in these experiments, uh, which are quite complex and I will not go in detail through, through them. Indeed, some of them uh, do die, some of the captive bred individuals that we've released, notably, for example, in the Balkans, do die in the sea when they are doing the sea crossing because they have chosen the wrong route and they don't go uh, uh, around Turkey and, um, and the Middle East. Some of them do fly large distances like this one that managed to fly 600 kilometers over uh, the open sea to arrive to um, Egypt. So uh, my final slides, this is really the global picture. Um, uh, you know, we have got in Europe uh, a very, a very, very uh, positive picture of vulture growth, particularly in Western Europe. Uh, the situation in the Balkans, the populations in the Balkans are very depleted. We are starting to see in the Balkans the same recovery as we had in, uh, in Western Europe, e even though at a, um, a much slower, uh, slower rate, only the Egyptian vulture in some regions is uh, uh, still declining. So my, my, my third and final message, um, uh, the, um, the griffin and, and cinereus vulture populations as well as the birded vulture populations are recovering in Europe. Uh, only the Egyptian vulture population uh, is still uh, declining in, in some areas. Um, uh, and uh, our focus now is really uh, to uh, work in the Balkans, where the populations are much smaller, much more fragile, much more uh, isolated and uh, separated, uh, to, um, to copy the success that we've been experiencing in Portugal, Spain and France and um, uh, uh, achieve a, a Europe-wide vulture, uh, vulture restoration. Um, in order to save vultures, uh, there are a few uh, key elements. One of them is that we need to agree priorities. But we have those because Europe has got a number of uh, international species action plans that precisely tell us exactly what needs to be done with vulture conservation. We need good legislation and enforcement. We've got the first one, the BIRDS Directive is the best nature conservation legislation in the world. Uh, and it's no surprise that vultures in Europe are doing so well because we really have got a very good legislation, legislative principle, which is the European Union legislation, which is then transposed in the European Union. And we have in Europe mostly some good enforcement, even though this can be improved, and we are working with national governments to improve the enforcement, the enforcement of uh, this good legislation. We need money. We do not achieve results if we do not have got some funds for nature conservation. Fortunately, in Europe, we've been having European Union budget lines like the Life Fund that is allowing us to do the, all this work that costs money, obviously, uh, with very good results. Without money, we, haven't had, we would not have had these results. And this is an important message to governments, uh, both at the European level and national level. With a little bit of money, we don't need much, with a little bit of money, we can really produce uh, wonderful results. But we do need, uh, we do need uh, money. We need governments that work with us. Uh, for legislation, for enforcement, and so on. But we also need 
uh, very good research, and we have got in Europe uh, fantastic um, know-how, know and knowledge on vultures that really underpins most of uh, the conservation that is going on. And finally, we do need uh, NGOs and people and ornithologists on the ground, uh, trained and with expertise and experience that uh, can implement these projects uh, in, um, in, in the field. And uh, uh, that's all. Um, I think that um, I would like to uh, um, just uh, say two things about threats to vultures. There are, there are really two main threats to vultures that we all need to implement uh, and have in mind when doing all these uh, reintroduction and uh, uh, restocking projects. One of them is poison. Poison is the number one kill, killer of vultures. Poison that is not intended, it's illegal. It's illegal to use poison to kill wildlife. The poison is not intended usually to vultures. The poison is intended to kill predators, wolves, foxes, and so on, that prey on uh, domestic animals or on uh, hunting species. And then hunters or livestock breeders usually use poison to get rid of those problematic situations. And, and vultures are um, the collateral victims. Um, the second very large problem with, that vultures have is collision and electrocution with, um, uh, with the, 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 the energy infrastructure. There are very simple solutions that can minimize this problem and we are implementing them across Europe. And finally, a third element which is extremely important is vultures need food. Vultures need dead animals. And these two maps are maps of uh, uh, lots of vultures that have been followed in Portugal and Spain. And if you can see, it looks like the Portugal, it looks like there is a, an invisible wall on the border between of Portugal and Spain. Uh, it looks like there's a screen and the vultures come, you know, fly in Spain and they arrive to Portugal and they then turn back and they don't, don't cross to Portugal. There is no invisible wall. The habitat is exactly the same. The land is not that much different. The, the population density is exactly the same, the two, the two sides of the border. The very big difference is that in Spain there's a lot of food because the Spanish legislation allows for uh, livestock breeders to leave some carcasses of dead animals under some conditions for the vultures while the Portuguese legislation does not allow yet that and therefore vultures uh, do not have that much food in Portugal uh, and they've got plenty of food in Spain. We are working uh, with the Portuguese authorities and with the veterinary Portuguese authorities which are showing more and more willingness to change the regulation and to adopt a system that um, mimics the Spanish, the Spanish project. In conclusion, and this is really my last slide before questions, Europe is today the land of vultures. Yes, we can. We can save vultures. We have the know-how. We have got the expertise. We, are, we have done it in Portugal, Spain, and France. We are doing it in the Balkans, which is currently uh, the, the, you know, the, the priority in Europe for vulture restoration. Long-term projects, step-by-step -step approach. It's essential to keep working on the threats, on the poison, on the electricity infrastructure, on the food. Otherwise, uh, these wonderful conservation stories can uh, evaporate. Thank you for your attention. Um, you can follow us on uh, our website, which has got daily uh, inform new information about vultures. We publish uh, uh, you know, every single day a new story about vultures, about our projects or projects done by, by other people. You can follow us on Twitter, uh, well, all the, social, uh, all the social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and so on. And, and, and you, should do, you should follow us because uh, we can only save vultures if we all together work uh, towards these uh, wonderful and fantastic birds. Thank you, and I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Pedro. We have a few questions already, and I think there's, there might be more coming in as we speak. Um, so there was a first question to do with the Egyptian vulture when you were talking, sort of describing the species, the species in general. Uh, Ineer was asking if the Egyptian vulture is an exception when it comes to the hunting, if they can hunt if they need to. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, even even uh, a scenarius vulture can, uh, in in exceptional circumstances, uh, you know, eat a small a small animal. But yes, Egyptian vultures can can also hunt. 
uh, very small animals, a lizard here and there, certainly insects, um, a small rodent if they take, if they take the chance. Um, but uh, we've studied the diet of all of them and uh, uh, the, major I mean, the, 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 the great uh, majority of the volume of food they eat, even in the Egyptian vulture, is dead, is, is dead, uh, dead animals. The Egyptian vulture also actually eats uh, the feces of other animals. Uh, and in fact, they, they get that beautiful yellow color they have in the face from some pigments that uh, that exist in some of the fecal elements, the, some of the feces of cows and and, and sheep and uh, and so on. So truly cleaning our fields, as we say, right? Um, so Carlos Alberto Huerta was asking where are the best places and the best time and what are the best times in Portugal to see vultures? Yes, uh, uh, thank you for the question. Well, I mean, vultures, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the problem with Portugal could have much, much, much higher populations of vultures. Uh, uh, there's very little food. Uh, however, they do breed in Portugal. They do breed mostly uh, in the river canyons uh, that separate us from Spain. The, the, the wonderful Douro Internacional, Tejo Internacional, uh, some, of the, some of the border areas uh, and the mountains and, and the cliffs in the border areas between Portugal and Spain. They, most of them then go and feed in Spain. They just use the, the canyons and the rock faces and the cliffs um, to breed. Uh, 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 so Douro Internacional, Tejo Internacional, all the area of Malcata, uh, uh, Pnamacor, Castelo Branco, uh, and then uh, the Alentejo area near the border. Uh, and because there is a little bit more uh, livestock breeding in Alentejo and because there is some mortality and, bird, and, and vultures are very good in detecting uh, uh, dead animals, they sometimes forage inland in Alentejo. So you can see vultures, particularly griffon vultures and scenarios vultures, uh, all the way across Alentejo, Castro Verde, uh, Évora, Beja, um, and, they can, and they can forage. They are sedentary species, um, uh, so they can, they, they can be seen except the Egyptian vulture all year round. Uh, obviously, they are at, at their best uh, during spring and summer uh, and those are usually the, the, the best times to uh, to go to those places and, and see see scenarios vultures or griffin vultures or egyptian vultures okay then we have a question about the bearded vulture breeding program uh you said that when they're placed on the platforms they're then uh fed without sort of contact with people and so Inej asks what about up until that time until those three months old is the contact also reduced with keepers how does that Indeed. work the, the 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 contact is reduced with the keepers and when they are in the cage where they are in the cage when they are in the aviary they are actually fed by their parents and this is really important uh, what we do is uh, and this is very interesting and i have to tell the story uh, well birded vultures they they usually put two eggs but but they, they show this, from this, this really unique trait, which is they only, uh, only one of them survive. Even if the two eggs hatch, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, older chick always kills the younger chick. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's called cainism. This is an adaptation to uh, scarce food in the environment. And like this, only one, one, one chick survives and, and then, then gets all the food that is available. Uh, so what we do in captivity, this would happen because this is genetic, this would happen. So what we do uh, is we take the second egg, we incubate it artificially. We then um, uh, uh, raise the chick during the first seven days because we know that during the first seven days, there is no human imprinting whatsoever. Uh, the human imprinting on this species starts on the seventh day. So on the seventh day, we stop, we stop with, with uh, feeding the chick and we put the chick in a, a, another pair that for some reason failed breeding. Um, and uh, so basically an adoptive pair that then feeds the chick. Um, so after seven days, we don't feed, we don't feed any chick. It's, it's the, the natural parents that feed the chick. When they are in the platforms, what we do, and it's quite difficult, we need to feed them either at night. So somebody needs to go to the platform and then throw the food at night so that the birds don't see the humans. Or in some cases where it is possible, we actually put some tubes from the cliff top uh, where we can actually put the food and it goes down the, uh, through those tubes to the platform so that the, 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 the birdie vulture chicks, they get their food, you know, every morning, uh, they don't see the humans and they are quite happy and quite well fed. I'm going to sneak in my own question to do with that, which is 
also because you said that you monitor these birds 24 seven when they're there. I mean, how remote are these locations? Do you have uh, people sort of spending the night up in the middle of the, the uh, mountains yes. to do that? They are, they are relatively remote. So you can imagine in some of the, in some of the sites in the Alps, we actually need uh, the army and sometimes a, 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 an helicopter actually brings a small cabin uh, not next to the nest. It's like a kilometer, a kilometer or a kilometer and a half from the, the hacking platform where, where some of our volunteers then stay for two months um, uh, in order to monitor it. So they, they, it is logistically quite difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can imagine this spring during the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, yeah. when people could not travel, we had to actually send the people there to the mountains. So we had to, to ask for special permits. We managed to get permits for everybody. And we managed to, because we, ba we basically managed to convince quite quite successfully and, and, and rightly so that nature conservation activities were essential activities like the activities of the nurses and the, the, the doctors and the policemen and the army were essential activities because nature is important to our well-being and therefore these permits were given and we managed to release birds even during the pandemic. Oh. Okay, so then there's quite a few questions about threats. Um, if I understood this correctly, and Ineers, please, if I didn't, jump into the chat and correct me. But I think you were mainly asking whether the threats have changed in the last 40 years. Ah, absolutely, uh, and and that is really the key to success. We we only reintroduce birds into uh, into a site when we are absolutely sure that the threats that were there and that led to the disappearance of the species are minimized. So we what we do is very thorough um, feasibility studies uh, to to make sure that that that, that was the case. Uh, and in fact, I mean, where, one example: the Alps. Uh, it, what happened in the Alps is people were shooting and poisoning birded vultures. Um, that uh, has changed radically and today nobody in the Alps uses use this poison and nobody shoots any longer through awareness and so on. The other thing that happened in the Alps is that 100 years ago uh, um, wild prey were very very rare in the Alps. The, the wild ungulates, the ibex, the chamois um, were very rare in the Alps again because of, of over hunting. Uh, the population of, of uh, chamois and ibex uh, has increased a lot in the Alps because of protection, protected areas and so on. Uh, these species have, have increased uh, a lot and therefore there's also uh, uh, much, much better food. Uh, but we are, we are vigilant. Uh, and for example, um, for, 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 for decades, the poison was not present in the Alps. And we started to see here and there in the, in the, in the recent years, uh, a couple of poisoning incidents. And this has to do with the return of the wolf to Europe. Um, uh, wolf has also been increasing and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, recovering some of the lost ground. And unfortunately, unlike the birded vulture, which is well liked by everybody, uh, the wolf uh, is a problematic species. Uh, in France, uh, if you go to meetings in local villages, and if you speak about the wolf, or in Spain, or in Portugal, half of the room leaves because they think that the wolf is uh, dangerous, because the wolf is, uh, you know, a, a negative thing because it kills uh, livestock breeders. Um, uh, and that's actually one of, of the, the added values and, and the fantastic thing about our project is that with the birded vulture, we are able to actually talk uh, in a very serene way with stakeholders that would not otherwise collaborate with conservation organizations. And even though we focus on the birded vulture, little by little, we are advancing wider biodiversity conservation issues. Um, and therefore, wolf people very often come to us and ask, well, we need your help because, you know, we cannot talk with them. You are talking with them because of your introduction project. Can at least, you know, you will start putting some things in the agenda so that we, we see some progress also with carnivore, you know, large carnivore conservation in those places. But yeah, absolutely, we need, we only reintroduce when the threats are minimized and we need to keep watching over them and keep minimizing them. So for example, you know, insulating lines, making, uh, working with the police uh, and with the authorities so that poisoning doesn't come back for these projects to be a success. I think Inish was also wondering whether the threats, whether the panorama has just changed and so there are now new threats that perhaps didn't exist before. <laughs> There are, there, are, there are indeed some new threats. That's a very good question. Uh, there are two threats in particular I can, I can very quickly uh, talk. One of them is lead. Um, uh, lead from uh, hunting. Uh, we've, we've banned lead from everything. We've learned lead from paint. We've learned lead from uh, uh, petrol. 
because lead is toxic. Lead, lead is toxic to, to you, to me, or to a birdied vulture. It's even more toxic to a birdied vulture because they, they've got, vultures in general have got very acidic stomachs and, the, and therefore the lead is much more absorbed, everything is much more absorbed much more quickly to the, to the blood. And what happens is if these birds um, eat um, carcasses of animals that have been shot by hunters with lead ammunition, they will ingest that, that lead shot. And therefore, they've got this, uh, uh, they die of, of, of lead poisoning. We are working, it doesn't make any sense for us to continue to hunt with lead ammunition. There is alternatives, there's plenty of alternatives, uh, uh, you know, non-lead ammunition with the same ballistic performance. We are working on this issue as well. Um, and we are working with the European Union uh, and, and national governments uh, to try to ban the use of lead shot. A second new threat that is emerging is veterinary medicines uh, because these birds eat uh, domestic livestock many of them are you know more and more intensively treated uh, with antibiotics with uh, you know uh, non-steroid uh, um, anti-inflammatory drugs and we we know that one or two of them are actually toxic to vultures including the one that has actually caused the decline of vultures in India, the one that I, I spoke in, in, in the beginning of my talk, um, was actually caused by um, a, a veterinary drug that went you know, everywhere in India uh, and then killed all the vultures there, which is unfortunately now available illegally for sale in Spain, uh, which we are also trying to ban or at, li or at least to minimize its use and, and, and make it, its use only uh, allowed in very controlled conditions where the animals are not allowed to go out so that if they die, the vultures don't eat them and they don't die because of this veterinary drag. Uh, but yeah, but uh, the, the threats have been changing. In general, they, um, quite a lot of the threats have decreased and hence the recovery of the vulture species. Uh, but we need to keep working on them and we need to keep uh, being vigilant for new threats. Okay. I think you've possibly already answered Francisco Pinheiro's question, which was about uh, diclofenac. So this veterinary drug that uh, caused uh, population, uh, cattle populations to decline, especially in, in Asia. I think that's what you were talking about just now, yes. right? But I can, say, I can say very quickly that we've asked for its ban in Europe. The European Union told us that uh, the, the way we, we manage uh, the carcasses in Europe is very different the way they manage in India. And if we adopt a few, a few um, uh, a, few, a few measures, uh, veterinary prescription, and very, you know, very rigid uh, instructions on about how, how the drug should be used. Um, we should be able to prevent the drug entering the vulture food chain. At, uh, up until the moment, this seems to be so. Uh, we've been looking for dead vultures. We've been doing analysis, and we haven't yet found a dead vulture killed by diclofenac in Spain, where the drug is already sold. Um, but we, uh, the European Union told us clearly that if this changes, if we start to see vultures uh, being poisoned and killed by diclofenac, they will, they will review their decision, and they might very well ban it. Um, so uh, at the moment, looks like the... the the uh, um, the rules that were introduced in order to prevent the clofenac from entering the vulture food chain are working uh, but this is something that is really worrying us so good news but keeping an eye on it um okay pablo has a couple of questions he thanks you for a very inter interesting presentation and he has a question about uh that he's uh, as far as he knows, the many vulture populations are supported by food supplied by humans. And so wondering to what extent the populations in Spain and elsewhere in Europe are becoming dependent on this supply. Yes, that, that's, a, that's a very, very good question. Um, so uh, in, in our reintroduction projects and with the birdied vulture in particular, uh, we try uh, not to use supplementary feeding sites. Uh, and that's the case in the Alps. Uh, there's no uh, supplementary feeding sites. Uh, and because indeed what, what we want is a, a sustainable natural population that responds to a, um, a, a you know, natural uh, occurrence of food. And in fact, the best system is the system that you have in Spain where farmers, livestock breeders can uh, uh, live in, on the ground some animals that die uh, for the vultures to come and consume in some areas where this is not possible or in some or in order to um, uh, prevent uh, some other threats occurring uh, we are using and, and everybody else is using supplementary feeding sites but we've got very strict protocols about the ones where uh, we uh, which we are using we try not to make them 
very regular. We uh, try not to uh, give uh, an overabundance of food, so we always feed according to the carrying capacity and the number of vultures present. Uh, but uh, in all our projects, the end objective is indeed to to, um, to arrive to a situation without supplementary feeding, uh, feeding sites. Having said this, supplementary feeding sites are wonderful places uh, to take pictures of birds, to see them in, in close proximity. There's a, a a public awareness and communication side of it that you can achieve there that you, you might not achieve in other places. So um, it's also interesting to uh, to have them. They can be good conservation tools used for some species. For example, the, the, the Egyptian vulture sometimes actually depends on, suppl on, on supplementary feeding sites, but we have to make sure that, that, that indeed those efforts are sustainable. Otherwise, we, uh, you know, we, we don't really want to artificialize the, the populations. But very good question and very topical on, on vulture conservation. Okay, couple of questions. I know we're right on the limit of time, but we've only got two questions left, I think. Uh, so there was a question, sorry, I just lost it in my chat. Uh, oh, there was someone, uh, Elena Costa was asking, are there any volunteer opportunities for biologists or vets within these reintroduction pro projects? There are, there are indeed. Uh, follow us, uh, follow follow our news, and 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 uh, get get in touch uh, with us through the um, through the website. Okay, check out the v VCF website. I'm going to drop a link to that at the end as well. And oh, Pablo's second question. I only gave you one of his questions. The second one was whether you see a possibility for an ex a natural expansion of vulture populations in Western Europe. Well, that's happening. That's happening. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the Cineris vulture recolonized Portugal. Uh, griffin vultures are expanding uh, and, and are breeding. Uh, only this year, for example, a pair of griffin vultures bred in Marão, uh, in Vila Real, in the north of Portugal, mm -hmm. an area where they haven't, they haven't bred for, uh, for many years with the growth of the populations. Yes. Now, there's, all, of course, a limit. For example, I would not expect this, the, the birded vulture uh, from Andalusia uh, to recolonize Portugal because uh, Portugal Portugal does not have much food. Uh, they like, in particular, birded vultures in particular like um, goat species, uh, the, the bones of goat species. So where you've got wild goats, uh, it, it is likely that they will come up. And in fact, for example, uh, many of the birded vultures reintroduced in Andalusia spent considerable part of time in Gredos, in the Sierra de Gredos, mm -hmm. because there's a very large population of Iberian uh, ibex, or uh, wild goats uh, in, in the Sierra, and they, they feed on, on, on the bones and the carcasses of those. So uh, I would say that if things go well, maybe in 20 or 30 years time, we might actually see a, a natural recolonization from Andalusia or from the Pyrenees uh, to, to the Sistema Central and to, and to Gredos. Um, uh, this is already happening. Uh, our reintroductions and our reinforcements just accelerate a little bit this process. Okay, and finally, I think there are two questions that I can maybe lump into one. Krij was asking your position about uh, news that has sort of recurringly occurs about um, vultures attacking uh, <laughs> flocks of sheep or what have you. And Francisco Pinheiro was essentially, I think, asking about how to work with local populations because he was in uh, Miranda do Douro recently and got the feeling from locals that they didn't feel involved in conservation and what the VCF's yeah. position is about that. Yeah, uh, in, incredibly important to involve everybody because everybody needs to know the, the, the role that vultures play. Uh, they are nature's cleanup crew and they will only really appreciate them if they know uh, what, what, what they do. Regarding the, the, the issue of, of you know, incidents and attacks on cattle, a uh, very good question again. I see that the audience is very, uh, you know, is very knowledgeable about vultures. This is indeed the problem. In our website, we actually have got a position paper on that. Uh, it might be buried, it might not be easy to find, if it, if, it, if it is not, you can drop me an email and I will send you the position paper. Uh, uh, so, so, I mean, let, let's put it clear. Um, uh, it is possible, uh, and it, it has happened because it has been documented on videos for vultures to start eating an animal that is not yet technically dead, but it is, that for one reason or the other is in the dying stages, either because it is you know, mortally wounded or because it is immobile and cannot move for some reason. And, and, and therefore what the vultures do is they respond to that apparent uh, you know, uh, 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 death and they start, they start indeed beaking on, on animals that 
otherwise would, would, would die. Um, uh, this is the case, for example, and this can be the case, for example, of mothers, mother cows or mother sheep, giving very difficult births where the, the newborn lamb or the newborn cow um, is stuck and both the mother and the cow probably would die uh, and the, the, there is a very acute uh, veterinary situation uh, and if nobody is there then and, and you know the, the, the animals are there the bird the, the birds the vultures can actually come and start to, you know trying to consume the animals before they are technically dead. However, most of the incidents or the alleged incidents are false uh, and because of a bad perception. We've done studies about that. Um, uh, there, because vultures are increasing, uh, there are many people that do not really know the ecology and the behavior of vultures. And what they see, unlike their grandparents, which had seen vultures consuming carcasses in the wild, uh, they, they haven't seen it because they had disappeared. Now the vultures are back and what they see is they see a, a live lamb in a field. They come back three hours later and they see a dead lamb in the field with 10 vultures on top and they see, oh, the vultures killed the lamb. Um, and therefore, uh, they, uh, you know, they, they, they put quite a lot of, of these uh, uh, you know, allegations which, which are not entirely true. So most of the reports are, um, uh, are, are not true. They, 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 uh, they are false perceptions because of lack of knowledge. Uh, some of them are indeed true. Uh, however, the impact, I mean, the, those, those animals would, uh, most of them, or, or virtually all of them would die in any case. And the impact that these um, uh, vultures eventually do on those uh, few incidents where this happens is uh, much, much smaller than the services uh, they provide and the benefit they bring um, to society as a whole and to the livestock breeders themselves by cleaning the countryside of dead animals, um, feces, and, and so on. But it's a very important topic. Uh, do read our position paper. Um, I think I just place. dropped a link in the chat to what I think might be the place where it is at least it's a news a news piece by VCF on the situation so I'm sure that from there you can find the position paper. Thank you Sonia. You're welcome. Uh, thank you all. I think that we've covered all the questions. There's lots of thank yous coming in on the chat. I'd like to add my thank you as well, uh, Zé Pedro. It's been a pleasure hosting this webinar. I'm going to drop a last couple of links in the uh, chat with the VCF website where you can find out more, including the volunteering opportunities that people were asking about. If you want to be one of those people who goes up in the into the mountains and stays there for ages, or if you want to get involved in other ways. I also dropped in sneakily, uh, Zé Pedro, a video uh, on your YouTube channel of that uh, um, tagging of the Cinereus vultures in the Douro uh, that I thought people might appreciate also since it's something that's happened here recently. So you can enjoy that uh, and see a little bit more of Zé Pedro in action. Um, <laughs> thank you all for watching and for staying with us for 10 minutes past the closing time. I hope that you've enjoyed this. I would like again to extend an invitation to join us on the remaining webinars uh, at the festival. So if you go to the festival online tab on the uh, birdwatchingsagdash.com website, you will be able to find more information about the other webinars that we still have happening. And as I say, most of them are not fully booked, so we will be just dropping the links to access them directly in there. Even if you haven't, re haven't registered, you can still join us. Uh, have a great rest of a Sunday. Thank you very much for joining Thank us, you. Pedro, and you. see you all soon. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.